Hey, and welcome to another installment of I Want to Tell You, a Beatles podcast. One of these days we'll come up with a better title, but probably not, because we're already like... This yeah, is, I mean, we're four albums deep Yeah, it's now. pointless now. It's 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 set in stone. Mm-hmm. Damn it. Um, I'm Sam. I'm Jake. And we're going to be talking about the Beatles' fourth album, Beatles for Sale. That's right. Um, so I think it's at this point that the Beatles like are starting to get a little tired. They're yeah, st- I, I would agree with that. They're being worn down. Sure. I mean, they're going full on since, you know, their professional studio release inception. And now it's, they're just not touring the UK. Yeah. Now they're touring the United States. Yeah. At this point, they've toured Australia, New Zealand. Well, they've, you know, like, you know, we said in the last, you know, the uh, last episode of Hard Day's Night, the movie... And the album has come out now, so now they are like movie stars. Red Hot. Yeah. Both sides of the Atlantic. Um, the problem is they're still expected to release. Even though they've released their first album with all original material, mm-hmm. they've started their first movie. They're appearing on talk shows or television programs on both sides of the Atlantic. Yep. They're doing sellout tours around the world. They still need to deliver yeah. a studio album by as, Christmas. As a reoccurring thing we've said a bunch of times, like... This is an era of, you know, in the 60s where you had to release stuff on like a monthly basis or else you would be deemed irrelevant. And that's going to seriously come into play later on. But, you know, um, and why it wasn't necessarily true. But here, yeah, I mean, they had to keep releasing, you know, even though they were these massive stars, you still had to keep producing music. Yeah. Um, And so even though here's I like Beatles for sale. Me too. I like it just fine. But I do think it is possibly the weakest album from the Beatles, like kind of like early period, like please please me through help. Um, here's a question: Would you rather take Beatles for Sale over with the Beatles or Please Please Me? Um, I, I'm gonna say yes, but I'm not gonna say that it's a better album than those. Um, which people are like, well, what do you mean? Um, but. Yeah, it's it's cle- it's evident that they are tired on this one. I mean, how would you answer that question? I would take Beatles for Sale over with the Beatles and Please Please Me. Mm-hmm. It's more polished. Um, th- as musicians, they're more confident. But sure. I mean, you look at the album cover. We were like, oh, this is an iconic album cover. This is an iconic album cover. This is an I- iconic album cover. And you get to Beatles for Sale and you're like, man, they all look ragged like some shit. Yeah. This is the poster you have in college, like, halfway through junior year, like on your wall when you're just dog tired and you're ready to leave it sums it up perfectly yeah that and the one with the pink Floyd with all those chicks and their butt cracks and they're all painted as the album covers yeah um but or the guys that have the pulp fiction poster of course yeah or the course. scarface poster and you're like that movie sucks yeah it does that movie does suck and i love al pacino but uh it sucks watch um carlito's way instead or watch the original scarface the shame of the nation starring george raft um but yeah it's there's some tracks on this that i love that are like you know if we're going like we're saying early days act one beatles or some of my favorite act one beatles songs for real um but yeah there's there's some wear and tear on this one and 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 you know it's it especially for an album that comes after a hard day's night it feels like a step back yeah they've it's some of the str- like the strongest john lennon songwriting ever not just like beatles but like solo career yeah um ever is on a hard day's night and then you get beatles for sale and it's like the cool thing about the Beatles songwriting influences is they've since toured the United States for the first time. So while they were over there, they're picking up like country albums and western albums, stuff that it was really hard to get a hold of in the in the UK. They meet Bob Dylan, he gets them hooked on on marijuana. Yeah. But um you know, John Lennon immediately takes to to Bob Dylan, you know, starts to ape his style. He starts to to write songs. It's really John or Bob Dylan that lets John Lennon know it's okay to put yourself into these songs. Yeah, and that must have been a massive revelation for John Lennon because he thought he had to be the tough guy, the the, the leader, the confident, yeah, cool guy. The first two albums or first two songs on this album are basically John Lennon saying, "I'm not that cool." <laughs> yeah, I mean in 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 story definitely in the first one and in title definitely in the second one. Oh yeah, um, but the first one. Uh, no reply. Uh, I love this song. I think this is a song that I really heard first as an outtake on the um, Beatles anthology, mm-hmm. and I. Uh, it's just yeah, it's a story where a guy is basically shunned at the door. Yeah, you know, he's trying to like find this 
chick. I think he's trying to call her and he's trying to see her in every which way. She's he's like getting shot down. And finally, like just kind of like Charlie Brown walks yeah. like, with his head down. It's almost a perfect prelude to the next song. But yeah, I, you know, really love the harmonies on this. Um, I like how it's kind of this slow. Uh, verse, a, yeah, and then the chorus it picks up a little bit, and it kind of has like a marimba feel. It to does, it too. yeah, 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 which is nice. I mean, it's it's a strong effort. Uh, it, it's an interesting way to start the album. Yeah, it's not like a a, a, a banger, you know, as they would say on Parks and Rec, <laughs> uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But yeah, it kind of perfectly sums up kind of what this album is. Um, not not an album of like missteps, and it's like you know you're a loser or whatever. But it's yeah, it's kind of this. Um, you know, like we'll probably say, a it's a more melancholy, yeah, reflective, melancholy, album. tired album. At this point, like the cracks in in John Lennon's bravado are starting to show, mm-hmm. and he's letting him show because John Bob Dylan's like, yeah, it's okay to let people know that you're flawed. It's totally fine. Yeah, and Lennon really takes that to heart on this album. Yeah, I mean, the second track, yep. is called "I'm a Loser." <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's the perfect follow up to a song about a guy who can't get a girl to answer the door. I love the melody. It's the most like Western song. It is, yeah. On this uh, on this album, I love the melody to it. The rhymes, mm. like lyrically, are like the simplest, yeah. like rhymes. Like now and then you see me as a clown, but under this I'm wearing a frown. Yeah. It's like, Jesus Christ! It also does the Lennon <laughs> baby's thing. first song. <laughs> it also does the Len- <laughs> baby's first song. Uh, it also does the Lennon thing where he'll stretch out a word. Uh, you know, it is I'm a loser. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but then it kind of kicks in with like the kind of like the, you know, like you're saying, like kind of that Western feel again. Really wearing their American influences, yeah, their newfound American influences. Oh, I mean, one. they 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 were already listening to like a lot of Western albums and country albums before sure. they they made it big. That was some of their. You can see some of those influences on their first records, but now they're like they've got access to basically any record in the world, yeah. and so you know they're over in the United States, they're eating that shit and up, and people are taking them more seriously too you know they're not i mean there is that stigma that will last uh until the real second act where people are like oh they're just a pop band um but they're starting to really gain steam though like pop bands can't make good songs yeah come on we've all listened to that latest justin bieber single true <laughs> but um <clears throat> i burped on purpose on that one yeah I'm, yeah yeah no it's all right it's fine <laughs> I, I don't. No, I don't, no, I don't mind that track. Yeah, I. Yeah, I don't. Perp- I don't really mind about the the Bieber. But the uh, <clears throat> the uh, next track is uh, is kind of a a number that was inspired by their original bassist, Babies in oh, Black. Oh yeah, this is my favorite track on the album. Really? Mm-hmm. This is one of my favorite Act One Beatles songs. It's an interesting one because it's a song about this like chick whose boyfriend died. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of like, but it's like a waltz almost. Yeah. And whenever they would play it live, like you can see him play it at Shea Stadium the following year, yeah. August of '65, they when they John Lennon introduces it, he's like, "Hey, this one's gonna come like this one's completely different." <laughs> and then like they mm-hmm. launch in the Babies in Black because compared to their big poppy happy numbers, it's a song about a lady who dresses in black ever since her boyfriend died it, because it was inspired by the original Beatles bassist was a guy by the name of Stuart Sutliff. Mm-hmm. When the Beatles are in Hamburg, shortly before they get their recording contract back in the UK, so they're playing shows in, in Hamburg, they're building their chops, as it were, um, he decides to leave the band to go to art school in Hamburg. Yeah. And he meets this German chick, and they fall in love, and he dies rather suddenly. I yeah, think of like brain a, aneurysm Yeah, at 21. That would do it, man. I think there's a um, graphic novel about him. I own it. Okay. Uh, I think I got it for you, actually. You did. Okay, so there definitely isn't a graphic novel. I was trying to remember because there was a couple Beatles ones that I was circling, um, and I couldn't remember exactly which one it was. But um, yeah, I, I love the guitar work on this, and I, I say it's heavy in like the sixty cents. I'm not like you know metal and stuff, but the the subject matter definitely, but also the clang of the guitars. I love McCartney's high vocals, high vocal harmonies on this. Um, some really wonderful stuff from him that really builds. Um, as we go into the Act 2 stuff and really becomes, for me, a signature of the McCartney vocal, like one of the reasons why it's like, hey, why do you have Paul McCartney as a vocalist? Well, this is one of the reasons, you know, listen to Babies in Black, uh, Babies in Black, uh, which is also just a great title. I love the title. I, I, lo- I really do just love everything about this song. Really one of my favorite just Beatles songs in general. Yeah, it's a really off-kilter song, mm-hmm. um, but they really took to it, I think, because it was one of their first songs that wasn't necessarily about somebody falling in love. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, again... L- you know look look back at like the earlier albums we've done where like by now you would have had kind of a 
a banger. <laughs> you know what I mean? And three and very morose songs. Three very morose like, songs. These morose motherfuckers. motherfuckers. Yeah, it looks like someone shitting your cereal. Bong. But um, yeah, you got a song about a guy who can't get a girl to answer the door, basically. <laughs> a guy who is a loser. <laughs> and then a girl who's um, dressed in black because yeah. her baby's dead just like that daniel radcliffe that movie baby but yeah 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 the, is it the man in black or the woman in black. woman in black yeah yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's some dude. yeah man in black is uh well yeah. johnny cash yeah. <laughs> um or the plural men in black i guess but yeah again i i really do love this song a lot it's one of my favorites yeah uh the next one is our first banger as yes. it were um, yeah so lennon of course very famously covers twist and shout in the first album i mean Matthew Broderick immortalizes it in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <laughs> yeah, in one of your least favorite movies of all time. Oh, I think it's the most one of the most overrated. Are they? The, is that is that like time. is that like the Chicago of movies? In terms of band, not you know, for, clear up for people out there. All these Chicago people. I like the city of Chicago just yeah. fine. The band Chicago <laughs> can go fuck themselves. There's not going to be a podcast that you're dealing with Chicago anytime soon. <laughs> like I go through album yeah, by album. Album, by album. This song sucks. Fuck this next, song. Next track. This song sucks. Yeah. This song sucks. Saturday in the Park. Fuck them. <laughs> Get it out of here. Um, I do like that song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that song a lot. But I mean, I don't know anything about them really. Yeah. I listen to them. No, you don't have to. Yeah. You don't. I, I mean, to. I'm not. You know, who knows? I'm not. Pl- they have plenty of fans. You don't. You don't need to join. You don't need to join. <laughs> you can if you want. Yeah. But fine. Yeah. I don't. I don't plan on it. But rock and roll music. Yes. A Chuck Berry number. Yes. The last time John Lennon covers Chuck Berry with the Beatles, um, I believe he covers them on the uh, his solo covers compilation rock and roll. Mm. But uh, is this the best cover they've ever they ever they've ever done? Like we because we talked about Mr. Postman like being like it's awesome. A lot of people are like that is how you cover a song, son. But is this their best one? Uh, I will honestly. I will. It. I don't. I think Mr. Postman's better than this. Yeah. Um but this is probably their most popular. It's a top rock and roll music. I Twist and Shout I would think is their most popular cover. Really? Okay. Yeah. I I feel for some reason I feel like nowadays if it's Matthew Broderick ro- saying saying this then Yeah. For some reason I feel like th- like nowadays this is more popular of Over, like a like, cover Beatles song more than, than Roll Over Beethoven. Yeah, I think so. I, I for some I just get that vibe like uh when I used to work in the comic shop that was like like the one of the songs that was always going and people were I mean you know, and we played all kinds of Beatles stuff, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, Lennon shreds on this one vocally. Yeah. You got George Martin on the piano. That's right. Uh, yeah. The secret weapon. Yeah. The fifth Beatle. <laughs> many, yeah. many claims to that title, but George Martin probably has one of the strongest. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, George, George and Brian <laughs> Epstein, those are pretty much the two yeah. that are for real deal. But, uh, no, I mean, it's a, it's a great number. Would you personally take this song over Twist and Shout? Uh, Yes. I do like in the live version. What is it when he's talking about shaking your jewelry, like in the in the front rows or yeah. whatever? Uh, he's playing for the queen. Yeah, uh, I will say one of their covers I like that's not a famous one, but it's on the anthology. Is shout? They covered shout and the Isley Brothers. That was a song that when my sister was really we had. There's a nine year di- uh, difference between us. When she was really young, like I'm talking like maybe one or two, she would run into my room, and she would like kind of freak out to play track 16 that's all she knew was track 16 because that was on i believe the second disc of the beatles anthology where they covered shout um, is that her favorite scene in animal house i don't think she's ever seen animal house <laughs> uh but probably probably like call back to some weird thing where she's like why do i love this song so much um but yeah no i, I think seen green day cover shout oh, really yeah nice always gets the crowd going but so you would say shout on the anthology is your favorite beatles cover yeah, for the nostalgia stuff, but I think I, I mean I think their best cover is 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 Mr. Postman. Uh, but rock and roll music is, uh, I mean, you put this on any put this on anywhere and it's gonna get people going. It's a it's a the first banger. Yeah, and the next track is the first McCartney track. We're like, you know, four songs deep. Yeah, oh, we haven't again, seen Lennon for the most part. Even yeah. though he didn't write rock and roll music, he's the one orchestrating that one. Yeah. Um, comes up with the arrangement mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but yeah so and this is an original McCartney number of yeah. course and I think it was at that moment that George Martin realized the songwriting potential that McCartney had McCartney I mean he's the one even early on in their their careers like this the one making the most interesting choices 
Lennon's very, you know, Lennon is building his kind of influences. Lennon's a chameleon. And he I mean is, that in the best way. Yeah. He really does reflect his influences. But but McCartney's is taking big swings uh, with songs like I'll Follow the Sun is next. And uh, yes. yeah, I mean, you know, again, he's not, he, he you know, he'll rely on kind of like the stuff that he's really good at. But yeah, writing these kind of more ballad type numbers. Well, and I remember as a kid, I was always like, one day you'll see, look mm-hmm. up to see I've, I always thought it was to see a gun. <laughs> yeah. But no. That's dark. It's a dark <laughs> album, dude. I'm, but I mean, like, that <laughs> is fucking dark. Although, honestly, in Eleanor Rigby, I always thought it was wiping the death from his hands, not the dirt, you know? Um, so I guess we're just morbid motherfuckers with the Beatles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we'll get to what what Lennon's whispering, literally, mm. not us, like, mishearing it. We'll get to Lennon, what Lennon's whispering and come together. Mm-hmm. We'll oh, that's get, eerie as shit. Yeah. Um, we'll get to to the disputed line from Strawberry Fields. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's plenty of dark stuff. Yeah, we'll get to later yeah, on. Totally not. But yeah, anyway. Us. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, the looking up and you'll see a gun. Uh, it's just that sounds. Like, it reminds me of that scene from The Punisher. The sea of gun. Yeah. When he, I mean, Punisher like sights are on top for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Blows his head off. I told uh. it to my dad. Uh, cause he was looking at some Punisher stuff, like getting ready for season two of the of Daredevil, and I told him that of that scene you were ta- telling me about, and the look on his face of like badass glee, he was like, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that." It's from the Garthinus Punisher Max run. Check it out, kids. yeah, yeah. And then listen to the Beatles while you're while you're reading the Punisher. Yeah, and think of that line. I used to listen to the Beatles while playing Wolfenstein 3D. Nice. I feel like I listen. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Probably Far Cry, like during the, some of the like Far Cry games, like Far Cry Two, it'd be like Ricky Gervais podcast and some Beatles tracks <laughs> thrown in for good measure. You can see it with three. There's more shit going on in three. Mm-hmm. The only one I can't see it fitting in would be uh, Blood Dragon because yeah. that's got its own awesome eighties. Yeah, soundtrack. Blood Dragon is is my favorite. If we're getting for real, I mean three is the best, but yeah, Blood Dragon. Now tw- we were talking about Twist and Chat, which has like Lennon famously like fucking shred his vocal cords yeah. literally on that album or on that track the opening his opening to the next track Mr. Moonlight which is another cover he really fucking like that's the most throat rending performance he has on this entire album yeah and I love it because it's totally naked it's just the straight voice yeah you know later on he'll ask Ringo to 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 slam on the crash for him to give him some confidence. This one is just boom, it goes right into it. Yeah. Because by let it be where he's asking Ringo to like, "Hey, I don't, you know, I'm kind of self-conscious about this. Could you hit that crash symbol first to cue me in?" Mm-hmm. Um he doesn't have those insecurities or hang-ups, or at least they're just starting to show. So they're he's not as consumed by them. Uh, Could you imagine the crash for this? <laughs> Mister Moonlight. And then it goes into this whole other thing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It, now, if we're talking like Marimba, kind yeah, of song. Yeah, that's what I'm, yeah, it goes in. Like, you're thinking, like, oh, so this song's going to fucking rock. And then it goes into something totally different. Yeah. It's the kind of stuff that you'd, like, imagine, like, in the. Just like the Mr. Moonlight. Yeah. <laughs> it plays at retirement homes when they have luau parties. Yeah. Probably. Probably. If I was a program director, that's where yeah. this track would come through. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we got a bingo. Mr. Moonlight. All these old fucks in Hawaiian shirts and. <laughs> Tommy yeah. Bahama shirts just dancing yeah. shitty plastic lays yeah, just yeah. dancing. Yeah. Um it's kind of a forgettable song. <laughs> yeah. I mean honestly uh, aside from like the scream in the beginning, yeah. it's fine. But yeah, yeah, the scream in the beginning is what I, I feel like is the most memorable moment and the sudden turn right after that of like, "Oh, yeah, oh, okay. We're going okay, let me cha cha cha." Yeah. Uh I would still probably take this over I'm a loser. Because the lyrics again and, and I'm a loser are just like Yeah, I I yeah Bush yeah. League, Lennon. Bush, Bush League, yeah. League. Baby's where's first <laughs> song. <laughs> where's that where's that plastic ono shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, I, I I'd agree with that. I'd take that take it over, I'm a loser. Now the next song is another cover mm-hmm. and it's kind of a medley. It's uh Oh. Yeah. Kansas great- City, hey, hey, hey. Which are two separate songs, but have a, the Beatles, Paul McCartney specifically arranged it to be one song because he was a huge fan yeah. of Little Richard, which we'll hear a little bit more down the line. And with this one, he was like, I want to do a fucking Little Richard cover with Kansas City. And so he does. The mashup. That's, that's awesome. Oh, it's great. It's really, really great. Um, 
Yeah, all the, the the two bangers are covers on this one so far. Like when you're going down it, you know. But and this closes out side one. Yeah, That's, so that for me is like the big thing about Beatles for Sale. The um, I mean, it's a more melancholy album, and the, you'll never have to like. That's never a turnoff for me. No, but uh, they go from putting out 13 original songs to having like just uh, it, it's almost a compilation of covers with this couple with a couple new Beatles tracks. Yeah, it's like when they would like when bands would release greatest hits with like and an ori- new original number, yeah, you know. And I'd still pick it up. Mm, yeah, even though I've had all, all yeah. those like individual Especially, albums. Yeah. It's like God. Damn it! Yeah, before um, the advent of iTunes. Yeah, <laughs> iTunes makes that you know. Point. Oh no, they do the album only now. But uh, though you don't see that as much. Not much. No, not as much. Yeah, not certainly not as much as you used to. Yeah. Oh yeah, you used to see it a lot. Yeah. Um. But yeah, on n- soundtracks especially. I mean, try to put yourself into the mindset of like a kid listening to this album when it comes out. Like you get it the day it comes out. You know, you have. You know. You know, you're not you're not picking up Hard Days Night on like VHS, obviously back then. But like you know, you've seen it in the theaters. You have a Hard Days Night the album playing, um, you know, on repeat because you're so excited. And you get this, and you're just like, "What <laughs> is like?" You're like, "This is I'm I'm bummed, man." Like yeah. because you know, Hard Days Night. You know, even though we talked about Side Two being darker, um, it still has oomph to it. Where you know, going by this track by track is very interesting because yeah, it's there's it it's not it's never a struggle for me on this on this album, but there is like you leave wanting a little bit more and and for side one it ends very strong uh with this cover and the way it's arranged i think is really well done well side two i mean if we're comparing it to a hard day's night in terms of like side one is light and side two is dark beatles for sale in a lot of ways is kind of the opposite right yeah from the outset you've got three downer songs and then somewhere in there you've got mr moonlight um which and i'll follow the sun is kind of a, a slower lower you know slower tempo sure. song as well Side two is the popular side. Side two is the happier, like what people think of like Beatles, like screaming girls and like oh like, the opening guys, track. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the one that if you're like you went out and bought it with your no lawnmower money in the '60s, and you put on side two, you're like please, 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 and you put it on, and eight days a week comes on, and you're like thank God, <laughs> because eight days a week is like classic Beatles. Well, and we, uh, you know, we've mentioned before how much like we take shit for granted, like. That the Beatles helped kind of revolutionize because yeah. the music industry was so like fucking Stone Age. Yeah. Back Help then. us! Yeah. Oh, we ha- we can't one yeah. channel at a time. Oh, Show us you have to have at least fourteen songs for it to be an album. Yeah, you can't start a song with a chorus. Yeah, uh, this with eight days a week. They started the song with a fade in, mm-hmm. which really hadn't happened in popular music before. And then going back to that imaginary kid listening to it with his lawnmower when he like cranks it up because he's like, "Why is it so low?" And yeah. then it just blew in and Ooh, uh, and he's just like, "Oh Jesus!" And the mom comes running downstairs. You listen to that devil music. <laughs> yeah, and that kid, like the yeah, and that's the kid ten years later, like in college, is all about Kiss. Yeah, um, <laughs> or Zeppelin, or Zeppelin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Seriously. But the, uh, yeah, Eight Days a Week, they would had originally written this song as a made-to-order radio single, because like Jake was saying, back in those days, you had to have, like, a new single every month. Yeah. Um, like, albums in that t- day and time, and the Beatles kind of helped change this. Oh, it's just all over their knob, but this, it's that kind I of... I mean... Pop. It's that kind of pattern. Yeah, I mean... Guys. Come on. Yeah. We're four, we're four albums. <laughs> we're four, we're four episodes <laughs> in of slobbing their knob. It's yeah. only going to get worse. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm, we haven't got to act let two Let me yet. loosen my job. a bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but the... Uh, <laughs> um, the <laughs> albums up until the Beatles showed up... Collect yourself, sir. ...were just collections of like stuff that weren't, wasn't good enough for a, a, a big single like every month. They're like, oh, okay, well, we have these other... like. 14 songs maybe we can you know make up the difference and get a couple singles out of this awesome so they had originally written eight days to week eight days a week as a made to order single Mm -hmm. the thing is nobody was really happy with it particularly not john lennon who had written it and they're like well i guess this is gonna be our big single and then john lennon wrote and they recorded i feel fine Mm -hmm. and they were like this one that's this a song one. that basically brought feedback to the masses. Yeah, and we'll get there. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely get there. That's your tease. <laughs> yeah, that's your little tease about I Feel Fine. And so that became the A-side single, and this they just relegated to um, they relegated it to Beatles for Sale, where it still was released as a From album single in the United States and hit number one. But the Beatles never really liked it, mm-hmm. at least not John. And so they never performed, even though it was a number one song in the u.s they never yeah. performed it live hey we're gonna play it shut up we're not playing that shit <laughs> we're gonna play blazers and black and yeah. you don't like it yeah 
<laughs> yeah. So uh, fine. yeah, I think it's a great number. Great way to open up side two. Here's something though: if this song was on like a hard day's night or an album, you know, uh, of more of kind of what you would quote unquote the classic Beatles, I guess, um, would it stand out as much? Uh, or does this does this song stand out so much because it's what people <laughs> on are, a lesser album? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Does it benefit from that? Well, I don't. First off, I don't think it would fit on a hard day's night. Sure, both tonally and because even the popular songs on a hard day's night have a little more grit to them. Mm-hmm. Um, if anything, it would probably fit on Help. Okay, yeah, I can see, I can see that. Which is which is their next album. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's. I don't know. I th- I like it where it is. But yeah. if I had to put it anywhere else, it would be on help. Well, I mean, it'd probably get lost in the shuffle. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, I wouldn't say like put it on another album. But if it was on another album, would it be as stand out of a track as it is on this? You know what I mean? Like, is this does the placement on it this in this album make it a more likable song? And here's the thing: what's the other standout song for the general public on this album? I'll follow the sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a loser. <laughs> What you are with those lyric writing abilities, Lennon. God damn it. <laughs> Baby's first song. <laughs> How many th- it's, uh, m- melodically, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, th- this is clearly the standout. You know, clearly the standout on the album. Um, yeah, and then maybe... I, I, Follow the Sun would be the other... I though guess, neither yeah. of those songs... We haven't gotten my favorite song on the album yet. Okay, we'll get there. Yeah, I assure you, because we've got more tracks yeah. to go through. But uh, yeah, it's a good way to open up side two. Uh, definitely a standout on the album. Mm-hmm. Definitely the the poppiest, happiest, gosh darniest. Yeah. Probably, which is why they Lennon didn't like it as much. He's like, yeah. this isn't that kind of album. This is an <laughs> album where we have I'm a loser and no reply. Yeah, we talk about a chick that only wears black now because her boyfriend fucking died. And Brian Epstein is like, God damn it! <laughs> like he's just. Yeah make these guys still look yeah, bright. Cheer up, boys. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta cheer up for the ladies. <laughs> uh, the next one is kind of a is a little ballady love song. It's a cover of Buddy Holly. Mm-hmm. Um, not the song Buddy Holly by Weezer. but That rather, would have been revolutionary. Yeah. Rivers Cuomo would just be like, it's not actually my song. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's an, uh, it was an outtake. <laughs> yeah. Uh, words of love. Mm-hmm. It's, I mean, it's just a, Kind of run of the mill. Yeah, it's not a bad song. No, but it's I, I'll take words of love over I'm a loser. Yeah, but um, I mean, it must have been you know it's got to be fun for them to play other songs you know um, to cover some of their favorite people. But again, it's just uh, like you said, run of the mill. Yeah, and the next one's kind of uh, they had covered Carl Perkins before, uh, like on Please Please Me, uh, you know, great country artist that was big in the like late 50s early 60s and they they do it for the last time here with uh honey don't um it's there, there's nothing yeah there is nothing <laughs> i remember talking to sam before we recorded this i was like there's gonna be a couple tracks on this where it's like serviceable yeah yeah <laughs> it's there yeah serviceable <laughs> at best yeah filler <laughs> uh it's the last carl perkins cover they ever do fine awesome yeah. put that in your little notebook <laughs> good <laughs> uh yeah skip that track so every little thing yeah. she does is magic yeah. by the police but no the next track is every little thing yeah. i was like wait what 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 album are we talking about what uh, band are we talking about? that would be off synchronicity if yeah. i remember correctly no it's off of regatta du blanc mm. if i remember i'm i'm i've always thought about doing a, p- a police um or is it ghost in the machine a police podcast yeah. is if you had to just real quick if you had to do another band podcast w- what would it be would it be a police <laughs> no yeah what would it, it be uh, well i mean it's time yeah but the problem is that's, that's a lot of episodes that's 27 studio albums two soundtracks yeah that's if we did it at our current pace of four um <laughs> one one episode every four weeks mm mm-hmm. mhm that means I would do uh oh shit, what would that be? A shit. Uh, yeah, a shit. I would it would take me over two years <laughs> to do all of David Bowie. So maybe not Bowie then. Would probably it? I love David Bowie. Yeah, yeah. Love him to bits. Yeah. But uh but no, I'd probably it, honestly and I've talked to other people about it, I think my next like solo series 
as kind of a break would not be music centric, mm. and it probably wouldn't be movie centric because you and Josh kind of have that on on tap, and uh, Chris kind of has the. Uh, I mean, not that I would ever do a laser disc one, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, I I wouldn't I couldn't talk about it. <laughs> but uh, no, if if I in a pipe dream world where <laughs> like it wouldn't matter that I would dedicate twenty nine months of <laughs> of programming, it would be it would probably be David Bowie. Bowie, yeah. Cool. But uh, every little thing, it's an original number. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Another Lennon track. Again, he's the songwriting powerhouse of the band at this point. It isn't until uh, really Revolver, Sgt. Pepper, where we start to see that shift. Um, you can argue Rubber Soul, but definitely by it's inescapable by Revolver and Sgt. Pepper. But uh, now it's okay. Yeah. It's another one you could probably skip, though. Just like Honey Don't. Honey Don't. Honey Don't listen to this one. Yeah. <laughs> Every little thing you should skip. However, we do get another one more bummed out Lennon song. Yeah. I don't want to spoil the party. What a line. I mean, what a title. Uh, yeah. I'm a loser. I don't want to spoil the party. It's this is the this is the John Lennon this is John Lennon on in therapy. Yeah. This is this is his cathartic album. Yeah. Um I mean, for fuck's sake, the next album he puts out is Help with an uh, exclamation point. Yeah, where he's like literally crying out for help and they're like, "Yo, speed it up, make it a pop song." Yeah. Yeah, originally it was a slow sad number. We'll get there. Mm-hmm. But the uh yeah, I mean, I don't. It's another kind of like kind of country tinged song. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's probably the song that has the most Bob Dylan influence on this. Um, though, I would take no reply or even dare I say it, I'm a loser over this one. Oh man, so this is like this is the the lowest of the low on the album then for you? Because uh, I feel like I'm a uh, loser was like. It's just because of the rhyming. Okay. <laughs> it's just because of the rhyming on that one. Yeah. If you guys write a song with baby's first song type lyrics, Sam's going to hate it. Yeah. Though beautiful metal- melody. Yeah. I'm a loser. Yeah. I can't necessarily say that with I don't want to spoil the party. Mm-hmm. I can't even be like, well, at least the melody's good. Yeah. At least the... Uh, well, again, you, you know, when 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 you're like thinking about, you know, talking about, you know, getting ready to review or talk about the album um, in great detail... The first thing I was thinking about is like go through each track list even before re- re-listening to it and re- trying to remember something that pops out. And like the past couple songs, it's just again serviceable. Nothing pops. Even, even I'm a loser stuff. You know, I remember the the kind of longer lend and the kind of the melody for it, the the lack of or rhyming, but lack of creativity on the rhyming. I guess so. Yeah. Uh, the next one is honestly my favorite track on the uh, track on the album. It's another McCartney number. If you think about it, it's only like. The second song he writes yeah. by himself on this album, uh, because again, very light McCartney light. Sure. Um, the uh, it's what you're doing, like the um, you've got George Harrison using the twelve string Rickenbacker, Excellent. basically kind of has a very kind of Birds sound to it because he was friends with the Birds and they yeah. they introduced him to the twelve string guitar and they were like, hey, and he's like, oh, this thing sounds fucking awesome. Um, and it kind of, so it kind of has that kind of jangly kind of melody to it. And it's, it's beautiful. I also like the, I, if we're talking rhyming structures, I actually like <laughs> what Paul McCartney's doing with the rhyming here. Yeah. The kind of like the rhyme that carries over to the next, the word carries over to the next line. What you're yeah. doing, I'm feeling blue and lonely. Yeah. yeah. That's the, if we're talking about Rivers Cuomo earlier, Rivers Cuomo would make a career off of that with exaggerating words to rhyme um, in very humorous effect. Kiads. Yeah. Marrying a biatch, having seven kiads. Yeah. But no, I mean, this is, it's got a nice kind of like dry drum beat by Ringo Starr as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this is, it's just a, it's a humdinger of a track. It's a, it's a, it's a good one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, I enjoy it too. The 12 string is a, is a nice uh, addition to it and it must have been a huge bump for the uh, for the uh for the birds to get that kind of little shout out um well i think like when you the birds cuz the birds start breaking it really big uh in the next year or so i mean obviously they're recording they're touring but you know they put out mr tambourine man they put out turn 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 um which kind of turn 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 has a kind of a similar guitar opening the do 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 i mean they they've got more of a cascading thing going on Bump, bump, 
But um, I think the association <laughs> between Beatles numbers using the twelve string and their singles using the twelve string certainly certainly helped. Yeah. Um, well, and, I feel like he thanked them um, on Harrison, the album. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on the album. Um, which you know, it's it's got to help having the biggest band in the world be like, "Hey, thanks, guys." Yeah, thank you. Thanks we've, for the inspiration yeah, on this one. Yeah, we've learned from you. Mm-hmm. Um, because even at their peak, the Beatles were never above learning what was around them. And that was always cool. Yeah, that's so. That's that's like fucking huge. That they were never satisfied, and they were yeah, they were never be like, "Oh, we're not going to listen to the music of today and stoop down to that." We are the music. Yeah, of today. we are bigger. Yeah, that's a lesson at how you succeed. And get better at what you're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You take notes. Yeah. And you try to look at what's coming next. Mm-hmm. Don't focus on the now. Focus on what's coming around the pike. Yeah. If you want to stay relevant. What is it? Not uh, um, don't go where the puck is. Go where the puck's going. For all you hockey fans out there, yeah. like that's basically Gretzky level. That's the Beatles in in hockey form. Yes. <laughs> now the <laughs> the next song is one of those songs that I always kind of like imagine would play like an American graffiti when they like. Pulled up to like drive in like restaurants and stuff. Ah, George. Yeah. It's a Lucas, not yeah. Harrison. <laughs> well, he he's the one that sings this track. Yeah. Um Everybody's trying to be my baby. Yeah, I love that the title. Yeah, and George Harrison trying to sell it. Yeah. Because everybody It's almost <laughs> I mean it, it, it's funny because you have a opening number which is no reply about somebody who can't get a girlfriend, and then you got the closing number about a guy You can't even get her to talk yeah, to him. Yeah. She like he he knows she's in the house. Yeah. And it's creepy that he's like knocking. He's like, "Oh, I guess there's no reply, no reply." And then, um, uh, at the uh, at the end, you got a track about a guy who's like, "Dude, everybody's trying to be my baby." Yeah. Is it a concept album, Jake? Uh, in in that sense, it follows. I, well, the funny thing is, anything can be a concept album. You know what I mean? They're like, "You try hard enough." Hey, in every track we talk about coffee. This is a concept album about coffee. You know, I think concept concept albums have <laughs> became this like up its own ass thing where it's like it's a concept album about death and then you like try to like map it out and you're like none of this none of this makes sense only people that get to do concept albums are pink floyd and david bowie guys yeah those are like those are the masters yeah green day uh uh, mcr sorry uh uh, and i like them but yeah but concept albums you know shooter jennings get the fuck out of here (laughs) that'll be that'll be the next thing we do concept albums it'll be like the wall Dark Side of the Moon. Dark Side of the Moon. It'll just be Pink Floyd. Okay. I mean, Bowie. You would could you do, do? Would you do a album? The album Pink Floyd. I couldn't because I don't love every album like I love every Beatles album. I'd have to really love every album, and that's not to say you know I, I think those like the early albums suck. I'm just not really into the early super psychedelic stuff. I never really liked that the Sid Barrett stuff. Um, of course, everyone knows the famous you know from Dark Side on until at least the Wall uh, or Animals. That uh, everyone's like, oh, oh, I you know know all about that. Um, I could talk about the wall for like ever. Um, what what band or musical act would you do your own kind of like um, album by album? Springsteen, Springsteen, or Queen? Or, yeah. I think Queen would be more enjoyable because Queen has this great two act thing where yeah. it's seventies and eighties. And there's also more theatricality to definitely. To, uh, you know, Springsteen f- is going for. I mean, you're more of an authority, but mm-hmm. like certainly in the '70s, before like the big synth era, he's yeah. going for like more of a stripped down sound. Yeah, the the whole blue collar thing, and and the fact that he realized like once he wasn't a blue collar guy anymore, he stopped writing blue collar songs. That was very smart. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because that would have it wouldn't have pissed people off, but people would have been like, "Dude, come on, you're like a millionaire." <laughs> You know, you can't really talk about blue collar stuff. I've seen but, your place in Asbury Park. Yeah, but the thing is, he never stopped fighting for the blue collar stuff. That was the difference. Um, but Queen, yeah, I mean, aside from like Flash Gordon and Hot Space, like there would be very two short episodes. Uh, but yeah, Queen, probably Queen. We have a short Beatles episode coming up. It's gonna, it's called <laughs> Yellow Submarine because there's only four <laughs> tracks on it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, Hot Space and Flash Gordon are full length motherfuckers. I mean, Flash Gordon would be more about the movie and how great. Flash's theme and the hero is like hero is like one of the greatest fucking queen songs of all time that song is heavy as shit i love it yeah back to the beatles Re- i mean it's the end of the album oh more queen then <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's your favorite queen album uh i'm a big fan of news of the world um but i mean i like is it the uh i mean night of the opera of course yeah. queen 2 of course yeah um talk about light and dark yeah that whole album's based on that sure sure um you know sheer heart attack uh, Day at the Races is okay. 
Um, how do you feel about jazz in the game? Jazz is one of my favorite of theirs because I think it's... Uh, I feel like Roger Taylor wasn't a big fan of that one. And it was called the first fascist rock album by Rolling Stone. Uh, they hated it. Fuck them. Um, I, think that, I think jazz is so fucking creative and cool. Uh, you know, really the last 70s album we get... But they do so many things that I never heard of on an album. And I'm, this is, you know, talking about obviously I wasn't alive when it came out. But like listening to it now and I still don't hear stuff like that, like on albums. That whole like snippet, like at the end of the album, they play like a clip of every song together. Or the fact that um, uh, uh, Brian May would tie like piano like string or piano wire to his guitar to, 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 uh, to make it sound like a sitar. And What's your favorite post Hot Space Queen album? Would it be like Mir- The Miracle? Miracle. Over innuendo, or? yeah. Well, innu- innuendo. It's sad because innuendo. You know, obviously, it's the last album with with Freddie Mercury alive when when he's making it, um, and that album is near perfect. Um, I think it's one of their best albums of all. You know, one of their best. It's up there with Night at the Opera, but it's sad because you realize, dude, this band would have crushed the '90s. This band would have been so interesting in the '90s because they always had the core Queen sound, but there are elements on like on uh the song innuendo um where or on the album innuendo sorry where there's like iron maiden-esque elements of like these crazy heavy harmonies brian may as like a parting gift to freddie mercury makes his guitar meow you know like um uh because they wrote the song delilah or um not delilah uh what the fuck is it called i can't remember what it's called off the time ahead roger taylor hated it but they were like you know what rest in peace freddie we're gonna put that on there for you um, if you did a Queen retrospective, would you include uh, um, From Heaven? Or oh, Made in Heaven? Made in Heaven. Uh, yeah, I would. Because they take... That has some really great stuff on it, but they take a lot of unused Freddie material and they put the Queen spin on, spin on it. So it sounds like a Queen album. Because I'll tell you right now, I have no plans on this podcast to do Beatles Anthology. Okay. Even though it has stuff that's on none of the studio yeah. albums. Yeah. Well, um, made it. Well, but Beatles anthology is like massive. Yeah. Made in Heaven is just a standard solo. I mean, it's just a standard album, right? You know? Yeah. Um. So it could be a fairly easy one. But I mean, you get there's a great moment in it where it's indistinct. You can't really hear anything, but they take a second of every Queen song ever played and they mash it into like a couple second blurb at the end of one of the songs which is kind of cool. But again, it's very much a celebration of Freddie Mercury's life. And the song Made in Heaven has some of the coolest Brian May guitar work you'll ever hear. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, Queen, I, I feel like would be fascinating because that's an album, that's a band like with the Beatles, with, with, like the Beatles, because they are very much like the Beatles for me in the 70s for what they did with the instrument instrumentation using that studio as an instrument is you can hear, I know everyone knows about Bohemian Rhapsody, but you can hear all of the ingredients that make Bohemian Rhapsody before Bohemian Rhapsody happens, and that's really cool. And there you have it. So there's your Queen podcast. Yeah. Maybe down the line, guys. Maybe down the line. Um, but yeah, Beatles for Sale, passable album. Uh, again, it's it's a step back. It is. But there's not very, very many of those in the Beatles um, yeah. history. I can't, I don't, you know. They're just at a point where they're just getting worn out professionally. Um it takes, ironically, it takes another movie, I guess, to kick them in the pants again. Yeah, my favorite of their movies. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'm more of a Hard Day's Night guy. But, I mean, yeah. I, I love all the Beatles films, except for Magical Mystery Tour. <laughs> uh. I rented that once uh, on, like, the Blockbuster, uh, like, their Netflix version, like, where they'd send you movies. And I rented it because I was like, I got to see this. I just got to see it. I know it's terrible. I got to see gotta. it. And I got NASCAR. It, it came with, they said, like, Magical Mystery Tour, the envelope, and I opened it up, and it was, like, NASCAR's Greatest Hits. Sign from God. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, "Well, not watching you can either watch of them." All the best parts of Magical Mystery Tour on YouTube. I feel like yeah, I feel like I've seen them on the yeah. anthology already. Anyway. Yeah, you can see John Lennon perform "I Am the Walrus." That's Paul's selling point. Yeah, for that. Just, yeah, whenever in interviews, he's also like, "Well, a lot of uh, people that were in film school at the time look at it as a uh, avant garde." It's like, "Fuck you!" Yeah, they, <laughs> no avant garde. Like John, uh, like John is French for bullshit. Yeah, and like uh, George Harrison would say, "Avant garde a clue." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that just as a final thought on on this? Is that their next backtracking moment in their career? Magical, Magical Mystery, Mystery Tour, Tour? The, the movie, the film. Well, they're out of their element when they're making Magical Mystery Tour. Yeah. We'll talk more about that when we get to Magical Mystery yeah. Tour. But until then, this has been another installment of I want to tell you. I'm Sam. I'm Jake. 
keep listening, Easy Rider. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>